Welcome to our review of Thrones of Valeria, a modern trick-taking card game for up to six players. Before we get too far in, we need to take a moment to thank Daily Magic Games for sending us review copies of their new small box Valeria games, including this one. Thrones of Valeria was designed by Matt Jacobs and features artwork from the awesome Miko. This game, along with two other small box Valeria games, as Sean just mentioned, were funded on Kickstarter and published by Daily Magic Games in 2022. Now, at this point, some people did get their games by the end of 2022, but it should be hitting retail stores now, with most backers already received their copy, if not all of them. I was not a backer, so I can't see the exact fulfillment, but I know most people have gotten their games. Now, Thrones of Valeria plays two to six players with games taking anywhere from half an hour to over an hour, depending on the player count. Mm -hmm. It's listed for eight plus, which seems about right to us, and has an MSRP of $30 USD. Now, Throne of Valeria is a two to six player, potentially team based, two round trick taking card game. Unique twists on trick taking mechanics include ranked suits, where the rank can change mid hand, three ranked jester cards, which can act as either the highest or lowest cards, unique card abilities for every card value, and a victory condition based on gold collected and not tricks won or lost. Check out our Thrones of Valeria unboxing video on YouTube to get a look at the components you get in this modern trick-taking card game. Now, in addition to nice, well-made linen finished deck of cards, you also get five Mahjong-style tiles, uh, tile-like guild tokens, a bag to pull these from at the start of the game, silver and gold tokens and cardboard, and a very clear and concise rule book with lots of examples. The cards themselves feature line art from the Miko, that is quite busy, and card information is only presented in the top left of each card. Mm -hmm. The cards are also designed to look well used and worn. You get cards numbered 1 to 9 in 5 different suits, as well as 3 Jester cards. The card artwork on each value is unique, and each of the 3 Jesters get their own artwork. You also get a set of 6 summary cards that do a great job mm -hmm. of giving you an overview of play and a list of various card abilities. Now, this small box game has a cardboard trough style insert, mainly meant to protect the game during shipping. Though it does work well enough to hold everything once you've punched everything and sorted it out. We personally keep all the coins in the bag with the guild tokens and just take them out before playing, then toss the cards into a baggie just to keep them from sliding all over the place. Overall, the physical component quality here is excellent, but we don't love the artwork direction on the cards. But more about that after an overview of play. So you start a game of Thrones of Valeria by placing the board in the center of the table and seating it with guild tokens pulled from the bag. The cards are shuffled and players are dealt a hand of cards with the number being determined by player count. So play starts with the player who holds the highest card of the top suit on the guild track, which is usually the nine. That player can then lead any card they wish. It doesn't have to be that top card. Now each card has an ability based on its value. As soon as the card is played, that ability activates and must be used. Mm -hmm. These abilities include, uh, in order of card value from one to nine, move any guild to the bottom of the ranking, steal two coins from another player, gain three coins from the bank, swap the rank of two guilds, draw the cards from the draw draw cards from the deck and select one to keep, get six gold if this card wins a trick, gain a gold from the bank and discard a card. Lock or unlock a guild, or lock, locked guilds can't change in their rank, and move a guild up two ranks. Now the Jester cards each have the ability to be the highest ranked card in play, but only if you pay a cost in gold equal to the card's rank. Remember, there's one to three ranks. These cards can also be played as a zero if you choose not to play the cost. Now one easily missed rule is that you cannot lead a Jester unless you have no other option. Now, in typical trick-taking style, the first card is led, everyone, after the first card is led, everyone else must follow suit if they can. If they can't, they can play any card from their hand. The trick is won by the highest card played from the highest ranked guild. Mm -hmm. This is trickier than it sounds because guilds can, and do, fluctuate during a, a hand. Now, when thinking of this game in terms of traditional trick-taking games, basically every guild trumps all the guilds under it, with the Jesters trumping all the guilds, but only if they're paid for. A player who won the trick 
then gets gold based on the rank of the guilds for the card they played. This gold reward ranges from five to negative three. Mm -hmm. Yes, this means you can lose gold by winning a trick, which is a big part of the game and how it works. You continue to play tricks until one player is out of cards at the end of a hand. Note, due to the fact there's a card that lets you draw additional cards and the card that lets you uh, gives you a gold and has you discard, it's actually common for different players to have varying amount of cards throughout the round and the end round trigger changing. Now once, the, now, once the first round ends, you gather all of the cards, including any cards left in a player's hand, shuffle them, and deal out a second hand. The guild rankings stay the same as they were at the end of the first round of play, and you play a full second round. Mm -hmm. At the end of the second round, the player with the most gold wins. Now, what we just described are the standard rules that work for three to six players. Thrones of Valeria can also be played as a two-player trick-taking game. When playing this way, each player is dealt a hand of 20 cards. They then split this into two 10-card decks, which they then use to play through each round. The first set in the first round and the second set in the second round. Now, another option when you have an even number of players is to play a team game. Players each have their own hands, but share a pile of gold between them. And it's the pair with the most gold at the end that wins the game. This is the recommended play way to play with four or six players. Now that's what the rule book recommends, but it's also what I personally would recommend having played a number of rounds of the standard game at different player counts and also trying the game team-based. Team-based to me is the way to go if you can. Now it sounds like we're on to some final thoughts on Thrones of Valeria. So trick-taking games are a part of growing up in southwestern Ontario. I've been playing some form of tricking card game, tricking card game, trick-taking card game for as long as I can remember. Heck, right now, my mom is at a Euchre Club currently playing a trick-taking card game for money. Around these parts, trick-taking is just ubiquitous. So especially in French communities, often people grew up playing these games with family, found communities at school to play them with, and grew up playing them at local places like churches or community halls. Yeah, it's pretty easy to say that most people around here, including us, are trick-taking fans, as are the people who we played this game with. Frankly, it would be pretty hard to find people who enjoyed games but didn't enjoy trick-taking games in these parts. Yeah, I actually don't know anyone offhand who doesn't enjoy trick-taking. So... The big thing here, though, is what's different? What sets us apart? So Thrones of Valeria introduces a number of new things to trick-taking, which actually can be a bit much for someone who's only used to traditional playing cards. The biggest adjustment I found was the fact that the suits have ranks and those ranks change, and that determines what card beats another card. This concept can be hard to remember, even after multiple plays, and even now, we often have a surprised player at the table who thought they took a trick but didn't because the rank shifted or totally thought someone else was taking a trick, but now they have to take it because, you know, they used an assassin, which actually put the rank of their assassin above the thing they assassinated, so they ended up taking a trick. The thing is, though, once you've figured out this ranking system and its impact on play, it really does shine and leads to some really interesting hands. It honestly might be easier if you didn't have preconceived ideas about Trump and suits going in. Yeah. Uh, as you wouldn't have to mentally shift from a fixed to a more changing Trump concept. I think there's a reason this game specifically avoided the use of the term Trump so that they're not getting people stuck in that euchre, these cards are higher than these cards all the time kind of thought. And then, you know, the lead suit is, is automatically the Trump and stuff like that. Now, another big change, which is tied to this, is the card abilities. These are pretty quick to pick up. Um, the iconography on the cards does a good job of reminding you what each card does. And it didn't take us many games before we could all leave the reference cards in the box. And everyone had pretty much internalized what the cards do. For example, writing this review, I was able to note down the full list of what everything did without having to check the card to make sure I was right. Now, while some reference cards of late have been wanting, these were certainly not. They were clear, concise, and really helped as you were slowly learning and memorizing the cards. Now, I will admit, everyone I've taught the game does use the cards a lot when they first start off. Now, the final change in this compared 
compared to any other uh, trick-taking game I've ever played, including modern and old ones, is that victory condition of having the most gold. Due to the fact that winning a trick could actually mean losing points rather than gaining them means you aren't playing to win every trick, which can be quite the adjustment for traditional card game players. I personally love this aspect of the game. But I, and I've also been told that it is possible to win this game without taking a single trick. So I've yet to see that in any of our games. I really dug this change. Though it can be easy to forget in the heat of the moment with so much going on, just trying to get in there and win tricks, you might be better casting off on. Yeah. Now, mechanically, Thrones of Valyria takes a bit to learn, but it's extremely enjoyable once you do. And a bit doesn't mean five plays like some other games we've reviewed in the past where it takes a level of system mastery. It just takes a couple rounds to get into the differences here from other trick-taking games. Now, each of the changes I just mentioned synchronize to make a fascinating game of cards with a nice short playing time that's just short enough that players are often begging to play a second round. Now, that I said mechanically there for a reason, because we have found some issues with the physical aspects of the game. There are some graphic design choices made here for the final production copy of the game that honestly just don't make a lot of sense. Indeed, and this is made more frustrating by how good the game is to play. Mm -hmm. In some cases, you need to push past these issues to thoroughly enjoy the game. Now, the first thing and the biggest thing that I noticed right when unboxing the game, being a longtime card player, is the information on the cards isn't flipped. I... Why? Why, when you make a game, especially when you're going with a trick-taking game based on traditional cards, you didn't make it flippable? You can only splay the cards when they're all face up. I found this really annoying. Even my kids complain having to constantly flip cards over at the start of each hand. They're like, oh, it's like every other card's upside down. And this was present in the prototype as well. There has, for whatever reason, been a top and a bottom to these cards all along, at least throughout the public versions. Next is the color choices. Now, this may also be a problem for color blindness. I'm not talking about that. Neither Sean or I or anyone I played the game with has that problem. Without any color-based vision issues, we all found the yellow and the silver or white, I'm not sure which color that you consider gray, cards hard to read. Not just on the table, like from across the table, but holding in them in your hand. Some of these are hard to tell apart, the three and the eight, for example. Now, interestingly, if you look up close, and I can't remember who noticed this, you can see that the numbers have a white outline, but they're on a white background, which just seems like an odd choice. Like all these needed to fix was a stroke one filter in Photoshop. Like, like I could have fixed this one myself. I don't know if they use Photoshop to design these cards, but there has to be an equivalent in whatever they did use to design these cards. Yeah, the white silver in particular, you really had to look at in some light to see that number at all. Yes. Now, I will admit, after multiple plays, what I learned to look at is the icons because each of the values does the same thing. So I notice if it locks, it's an eight, not a three. If it lets me collect three cards, but we shouldn't have to get to that point. Now, similarly, we found the blue and green guild symbols hard to see the symbol on due to color. Now, again, no one has color blindness, so all of us can go, well, that's blue, that's green, we're fine. But I can totally see that if you could not tell the blue and green apart, you also wouldn't be able to tell them apart by the symbols, because the symbols over the colors are just not dark enough or light enough. I don't even know which way it should go. Yeah, realistically, I think the guild symbol just needs to be darker. The lines are not black, so they don't have as much contrast with the surrounding color as they need to. I would just put that white outline on the symbols and the black outline on. <laughs> now, one that totally doesn't affect gameplay at all, but I just happened to notice when I was taking pictures for a recent gameplay is that the card backs are designed to look worn. But the worn bits aren't where your fingers would hold the cards. And it honestly, to me, looks like they printed the card backs upside down. This was something I hadn't noticed at all, and is perhaps the least problematic of the issues, as it in no way no. impacts card play, except that it might push you towards picking up your cards the wrong way when looking at them face down. So that's true. Because there is a top and a bottom, if you look at it and think, oh, that's the bottom of the card, and pick it up and hold it that way, it's going to be upside down for you. Maybe that's my kid's problem. I have to, I have to teach them how to pick the cards up from the backs, and it might be better. 
Now, sticking with that whole worn card look, this is also a problem on the front of the cards. The problem here is the cards look dirty. They look like they need to be wiped down with a damp cloth or something. Now, this one didn't bother me as much, except for the fact that that color of background didn't go well with some of the colors of the fonts. But Sean actually found this bothered you well, like you found this bothered you while you were playing the game. Yeah, I, I don't know if I had have some sort of compulsion that I wasn't aware of, but I found it wildly distracting. Maybe I'm just conscious of trying to be nice to other people's game components, but I just wanted to clean them. It really looks like dirty, nasty fingers have smeared crud all over the cards. Maybe we finally found a game where you might as well use those Cheetos because the cards are already look kind of nasty. I don't know. Uh, now, my final issue is the artwork itself. And, and this one honestly has been mixed. Some players dig it. Some don't like it. I just think it's an interesting choice. I think it looks very unique, though, compared to other Valeria games. And I probably wouldn't have as much of a concern with it. Or, uh, I, I wouldn't. I'd like it more if I hadn't seen the prototype on the Kickstarter. Because the prototype artwork is full color Miko art that looks like what we've seen in previous Valeria games, especially going all the way back to Card Kingdoms. That's what's there. These, though, look very stylistic, very angled line drawings with splashes of color, which is not what I expect from a Valeria game. Now, while I do quite like the art, it doesn't say Valeria. It's beautiful, as we would expect from the Miko, but it's not what I expect from a Valeria game. Mm -hmm. And we've played quite a few of those, I think most will admit. Now, as Mo mentioned, having seen the prototype art on Board Game Geek, it looks very much like a Valeria game and would have gone a long way to making this game feel like it was part of the Valeria world. Which is our final issue with Thrones of Valeria. Uh, there's really nothing here tying this game to the Valeria universe. There's no background on these five different guilds. They're just different suit colors. The artwork doesn't tie in with the other games. And while battling monsters has just been a Valeria thing, game for, thing from the beginning, where's some monsters to fight? Like, of all these new small box Valeria games, this one feels the least Valeria-like. Like, this is could have been any theme, and the game would still work. Absolutely. A fantastic game that someone slapped the Valeria name on and made sure four established guild colors matched, but then added an extra guild. See, that last one should have just been the red for the monsters, and then at least there'd be something... I still think the guilds should have been the four citizen types that have been present in most of the Valeria games, with the fifth being the monsters. But whatever, choices were made. The thing is, like, I, these are complaints. Yes, they are complaints. They're the, but they're complaints about the graphic design and art choices that are all washed away by how well Thrones of Valeria plays. This is one of the best modern trick-taking games I've played. Everyone from my youngest daughter to her grandmother have enjoyed playing it. It was a hit with my usable game group as well as my family. I can 100% live with the dirt. It really is that good of a trick-taking game. Now, my favorite way to play Thrones of Valeria is the team-based version. This method of play helps negate any bad hand problems while adding that fun, interesting level of player interaction that you can't find without playing with a teammate. This is what switches this from a good, possibly even great, to an even better taking game so some people may find the mitigation of problems to soften the game a bit too much while i think for euchre players in particular it's a very familiar concept yeah it, it does it makes the game feel i don't know more rewarding in a way and and more we did it together it's again euchre versus hearts for example for, for two traditional card games now my least favorite way to play is the two-player game so I can totally see how this could appeal to some gamers. Two-player Thrones of Valeria is super strategic, as you have to select both your hands for both rounds of play before you start. The only thing you get to see is those guild ranks. In this version, all but eight cards start in play, which makes this a dream for the card counters out there. Personally, I have a hard time and enough trying to remember what I played the first round of a hand, the first trick in a given round, let alone remembering what the 10 cards I put aside for next round were, let alone what must be left in my opponent's hand. Like by the time you get to that, you know, three cards left in the fourth round, I have no clue what anyone has except for those cards in my hand. 
Yeah, I accept that some publishers are going to try and maximize player counts for all games now, but sometimes it's too much of a stretch. There are trick-taking games out there specifically designed for two players. Mm -hmm. We've reviewed them. We like them. I don't need another one shoehorned in. I gotta say, this does feel like those other games in a way because it plays so different from the base game. I almost wonder if they could have sold it as a standalone two-player game. Now, the other thing is Thrones of Larry does work well three to six players with the standard rules. I have no problem playing with them, but I just found that once I tried it with teams, I'm like, oh, I'd prefer not to play with teams. If I if if teams is an option, I'm going to play with teams. If you enjoy trick taking games at all, you need to pick up Thrones of Valeria. I, I don't even think you need to try it. You don't you don't have to play it anywhere. I don't know if there's like a tabletop simulator you can try. You don't need to. Just go buy it. If you like trick taking games, specifically Euchre, if you like the Euchre team based play, go get this game. This is a fantastic modern take on classic trick taking mechanics with some fascinating twists. So the only cave- uh, caveat being if you have vision or color blindness issues. Check yeah. a copy in advance before purchasing, because that could be one deal breaker here for some people, and that is its accessibility. Now, if trick taking isn't your jam, you probably haven't listened this long, but I'm not sure if there's anything groundbreaking enough here to win you over. Yes, it's doing some new stuff, but it's still a trick taking game. So it might be worth giving a shot if you like games with more strategy and tactics. There is more of that going on here. You might even have fun trying to be that first person who wins without taking any tricks. There is no shoot the moon rule for that. If if you can get through, like, it's not like hearts where if, you know, take all of the bad suit or is that spades? That's hearts, right? If you take all the hearts, you you gain points instead of losing them. Now, where I think this game is going to be a hidden gem is the deep thinking two player abstract strategy players. Because playing Thrones of Valeria two player feels like a chess match. Trying to outthink your opponent, using knowledge of what cards you've seen to predict what your opponent will play. I know a couple of local gamers I think will adore this as a two-player experience. And if that's your jam, you may just be in luck. Personally, I'll be sticking with four or six team games. And last week, you only get three or five players. Then I'm happy to play a standard game. Well, that wraps up our review of Thrones of Valeria. If you have played this game or pick it up later, please stop by and let us know what you thought. 